Hi guys, it is a stormy, cold, gloomy day. I think the first day of spring here in the of 2020 and the collapse of global industrial civilization here and the tornado racked perhaps state of Texas here on the first day of spring 2020. And this is Sam Mitchell and you have found your way to Collapse Chronicles. But as you probably know this week, we are doing a special series here, the Coronavirus Chronicles, where I am having the great pleasure of talking to a wide variety, about two dozen folks from around the rabbit hole here. And it gives me great pleasure in this segment. We're going to go to Georgetown University, where we're going to speak with... <coughs> ecological historian Professor John McNeil, who I've had on the show before, and we're going to get John to uh, hopefully bring some sort of ecological historical perspective to what uh, is re history repeating itself, perhaps, or a new phase of history beginning. So, John McNeil, come on and say hi, and we're going to dive right into this. Hi, everybody, and thanks, Sam, for inviting me back. Okay, so uh, I forgot to ask John uh, before we started if he had received this this outline of uh, eight questions that I've been using as a guide to this conversation. Um, probably you did, but I may not have studied up properly. Okay, well, that's that, that's fine, Professor. You, you know, it, it's I, I don't have the questions in front of me either, but uh, but, but I, know, I, I know the drill by now, so uh, this is just to help us keep focused for the next 20 minutes or so. So the, the first question uh, on your exam, Professor, is uh, kind of the essay question. We're going to start with the essay question before we start breaking it down. So John McNeil, as a historian, uh, l looking at the past, do you think the coronavirus could be the trigger that could lead to the beginning of the end for global industrial civilization, and why or why not? Uh, it sure is a big question, Sam. So my answer would be probably not, and the main reason for that is that its uh, demographic impact is likely to be considerably smaller than that of the 1918 flu, which did not lead to the collapse of global industrial civilization. It did lead to a considerable dislocation that lasted a couple of years, and in this case, I would expect the same considerable dislocation that lasts a couple of years. But in five years, I would imagine that this will be uh, safely behind us. And we will probably be confronting some even bigger catastrophe, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to, to that a little, bit, to, a little bit later. So uh, on the list of, of threats against, uh, against our civilization, where would you put uh, the, this later? Where would you put the coronavirus on the list of threats? Is it at the top, at the bottom, somewhere in the middle? Uh, I would put it uh, well below climate change because this is much easier to deal with than is climate change. And I would put it well below... Uh, nuclear war because the possible consequences of nuclear war are extreme demographically, economically, and in every other respect, much more so than any realistic scenario for COVID-19. So emerging infections as a class, which would include several other things besides um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, are a real threat uh, to human health. But this particular one is probably uh, one that we know how to combat. 
Uh, okay, so uh, we're, we're, we're going to get to the, the response in a, in a minute, but before we do, I, I want to clarify from your position, do you think the, the, the literal health effects of the virus against humanity in, in, the, in the long run, are they going to be bigger or are the various knock-on economic and social effects uh, stemming from the virus itself ultimately going to be the bigger story the, in the history books about what happened in the year 2020? Well, when it comes to what's going to be the bigger story in the history books, I would predict it will be the knock-on effects, uh, as you call them. But to some extent, this is a matter of apples and oranges weighing the loss of human life against the uh, decline of economic output. But if you were to be callous about it and consider these things in uh, proportional terms, then I think there's a strong argument for the knock-on effects being more significant. The reason I say that is because, you know, so far uh, roughly 10,000 people around the world have been killed by this virus. It may be 100,000. It may be a million before it's done. We don't know. But every year, 55 million people die. And so even if it is a million, it's going to raise the death rate for 2020 by 2%. Whereas the effects on the global economy are likely to be much more than 2%. So if one wishes to be callous about it and consider it merely in quantitative terms, then there is, as I say, a strong argument for expecting the knock-on effects to outweigh the direct effects to human health. Okay, okay. I think that that's, I, I have never, you're the first person who's, who's, who's put it in that perspective. And that, that does, that does make sense because for, for the more people are going to feel the pain of corona, coronavirus economically than they are physically is, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, obviously if you die from it, uh, your 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 pain is going to be greater, I guess, uh, than than people who don't die from it. But you know what I'm saying. The gen for for the vast majority of people, particularly in modern industrial society, uh, the the pain is going to be greater economically than physically. Do you agree with that? Definitely. I mean, dozens of people are going to lose their jobs for every person who dies of this. And it's going to be, paradoxically, in the most uh, <clears throat> developed industrialized economies in which this is felt hardest. And the reason for that is these are the most urbanized parts of the world. And not only is the disease going to have more impact in urban areas, but rural populations can feed themselves even if they're cut off from the daily exchanges of the marketplace, by and large. I'll put it this way. They're much better positioned to feed themselves and to survive comfortably, um, or at least comfortably relative to their normal standards, than our urban populations who depend on the daily importation of food from elsewhere, not to mention every other kind of supplies. So the economic pain is going to be quite unevenly distributed between rural and, excuse me, urban and rural populations. But um, within those urbanized populations, it's people who are involved in retail and restaurant and bars a lot of these people are already losing their jobs and they don't have much in the way of backup support. So that's going to be hard. Yes, they, it's the bit bigger they come, the harder they fall type type thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, comparing that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, 
So I want to, in, in the middle of this conversation, which since we're 10 minutes into it, we're in the middle of it, I want to get your opinion of, well, you're, you're here in the United States. I've, I've been going all over the planet, so we're mainly going to be looking at the U.S., although this is more and more true in, in, in other countries. It, I, I want to talk about first about the, the government, the official government response to the problem, the way it's unfolding. Some people would say the increasingly authoritarian and draconian response to the problem. Do you think the response is, do you think it's overstated? You, are they overplaying their hand? Is Are they underplaying their hand? Or are they getting it just about right from the official government response end of it? Uh, if you're asking about this country, I think the response has been on the par of what you would expect from the Three Stooges. <laughs> it, first of all, it was late. It took um, at least months after the warning lights were blinking red to do anything at all. And then it was slow. And it's still slow. And it's built on a, a foundation of unpreparedness. So if you contrast the U.S. response to what is evident in South Korea or Singapore, you can see how unprepared we were in this country, how slow the federal government was to respond after the weeks of denial that anything needed to be done. And then thirdly, once the recognition that things needed to be done came, how slow the federal government has been to enact measures. This is a sort of crisis in which the appropriate thing to do as has been done in Singapore, is to bite the bullet and absorb a lot of inconvenient up front in order to break the transmission cycle. Well, I just interviewed yeah. someone from Singapore uh, last night, and that's not the report that I got from Singapore. That in Singapore, the, the restaurants and cafes and bars are still open. There's uh, plenty of food on the shelves. It seems to be less uh, affected. You think of Sing Singapore as a very authoritarian government, but uh, strangely enough, it's you're, you're you're not seeing the, uh, the the panic buying and the hoarding and uh, and the shutting down of businesses and stuff. Now, now, of course, Singapore is a small island. It's a little bit easier to, you know, than than, than uh, the United States of America. Uh, yeah. So, Sam, first of all, uh, panic buying isn't necessary, and shutting down bars and restaurants aren't necessary if you act swiftly and isolate everybody who has uh, any symptoms or has come in contact with anybody who has symptoms. In Singapore, they don't let those people go home. Yeah. They keep them in hospitals. And at the footnote, I should say, to do this, you have to have hospital capacity that we do not have in this country because we run our hospital system according to other priorities. So uh, Singapore is able to do things that would be very difficult to do here, but not probably impossible, but they have not been done. And as a result, we are engaged in uh, catch-up measures, which require more sacrifice on the part of the general citizenry because the government has been unable to address the problem vigorously and quickly, which it has done in Singapore. Yeah. So it's almost like instead of either or, we have both and <laughs> with the, with the government uh, with with the, with the stooges. Uh, instead of one stooge, we have all the stooges uh, coming on. We, we, it's too little and too much at the same time. This contradiction is starting to emerge over these 
uh, over these interviews where I'm beginning to uh, to figure out that 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 you can see both sides of this. It, it's too little late. Well, too I, much. I, it, <laughs> it's too little too late, and the fact that we're doing a whole lot more shutting down of ordinary citizen mixing than Singapore is doing is a cost that we pay because we did too little too late early on. We weren't doing anything in January, uh, and Singapore was doing a lot in January. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's failure to recognize a crisis on the horizon, and I would say a failure to um, recognize the authority of expertise. So we have uh, people in positions of power who uh, are reflexively skeptical of uh, expertise and actually have dismantled government organs that um, contain expertise relevant to this. I'm referring to the dissolution of the biosecurity directorate within the National Security Council, which happened in 2018. Uh, so it's... Well, certainly we've exposed that 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 we're completely unable. That if you're depending on the government to uh, to have you covered in a situation like this, that they, they almost however you look at it, as far as the preparedness report card, we get an F. I would agree with that. And all you have to do is look at South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and Japan, and to some extent even Canada. Now, in fairness, they all had a bad experience with SARS in 2003. But they paid attention. They learned. In the United States, we had a less bad experience with SARS in 2003, but didn't pay attention and didn't learn. Yeah. And so it's not it's, it's not so big of a, of a surprise to to you. Uh, it is not a great surprise. It is, however, a great disappointment. Now, is this anything uh, out of step of historical precedent, uh, or have you studied such things as the government response to pandemics in the past? Is, is this is this bungled response representative of, of the way we've done it in the past? Or is it getting better or getting worse? I haven't studied these matters in detail. However, I would say that a bungled response to disease outbreaks is not at all unusual, and part of the reason for that is understanding disease out outbreaks uh, from a scientific perspective was impossible before the 1880s, and it wasn't all that easy even uh, 100 years ago at the time of the 1918 flu. So it's actually easier now to do it better but we aren't doing it better, and that's partly a failure to uh, recognize the, the possibilities, and the failure to recognize possibilities is partly a failure to pay attention to the past. If we were aware in policy circles of the certainty, not probability, but certainty, that sooner or later we would be faced with a uh, highly infectious and dangerous pathogen that we need to be prepared for, then uh, we might prepare for it. But uh, in the absence of that recognition, which is a failure to understand the long-term patterns, uh, the ecological balances between human societies and pathogens, in the absence of that understanding, well, we will always be unprepared and always bungle like the Three Stooges. And it's, you could probably extrapolate uh, from pandemics into other uh, things that are going to un unfold in the, in the near future. I would, you wouldn't be jumping to yeah. that much of a conclusion. Yes, we're particularly poor at preparing for the 
high magnitude but low probability event. But anybody with any experience of life, let alone a knowledge of history, recognizes that sooner or later the high magnitude, low probability event is going to come. I'm having it right now, uh, John, trying to sell a house. And, uh, li listing a house for sale in March 8th of 2020 is a, is a uh, low probability, high, uh, high negativity event. I know exactly what you're talking about. I am experiencing the pain in my own life. But uh, we need to... Uh, I, I want to, uh, since we're already 20 minutes into this, we're only going to have a few minutes. Just the reaction of the general public, uh, which I call, uh, I am calling it a snapshot in, into the future of, uh, of, as more of these events come come along, I, I am predicting more hoarding, more gun sales, and, and that. I want you to give me the the uh, historical perspective. Do you think what we're seeing as far as the the panic, the whole panic mode that we're on, uh, that people are operating out of fear, is, is this, have we seen this before in history? Is this anything unusual of uh, the human reaction to such an event? Uh, it's not all that unusual. Um, what it represents, I think, is uh, a lack of trust, partly in one's fellow citizen, but also in uh, structures of authority. Nobody is confident in this country that they're going to be able to get their daily necessities next week so they lay in as much as they can uh, right now and i can't say that that's an irrational response yeah. we don't actually know what to, what to expect next week or the week after well it's a and as doing things like buying guns um certainly in this country uh well most of the people who want to buy guns already have guns so i wouldn't expect a surge in that well, I think it's the people who have who have one gun now own five guns uh, <laughs> because it, because there is I, I mean there is a statistical surge in gun sales at least here in Texas they're going they're going through the roof guns and ammo. Uh, perhaps I under underestimate the appetite for armament. At least in Texas. Yeah, you should you should study what's going on in uh, gun and ammo sales uh, the past week, at least here in the great state of Texas. Uh, but I think it's safe to say, I, I know historians don't like to predict the future, but it's a fairly no-brainer that we're going to have more coronaviruses and things bigger than this coming down the pike in the fairly near future. Would you at least stick your neck out that far? Depends what we need, mean by fairly near. But uh, certainly uh, what in the world of epidemiology are called emerging diseases or emerging infections, there will be more of these. And the next one could be harder to handle than COVID-19. That's a distinct possibility. But as I said before, I think looming behind all this uh, is the much larger scale uh, crisis of climate change, which we are doing very little to address. So the response that we're seeing to the lesser threat of coronavirus might be a, a window into the future of what the response to to climate change once it really kicks in is is that is that a uh, yeah safe bet? I would expect them bungling yeah I would expect them bungling when uh, when that does uh, kick in a little bit more authoritatively than it already has uh, more more yeah, will, uh, more bungling where this came from. Do. Okay, well, it, unbelievable. we are already 25 minutes into this. I, 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 I could easily have made every one of these uh, interviews go on for two hours, but 
I uh, have a lot of folks on the list to talk to. So, guys, if you enjoy what John has shared with us, uh, you, you want to go find my, my full hour-long interview with John here in the Chronicles. You can look that up. And if you enjoyed what he had to share with you, please thumb up this video and do subscribe when you're over here and keep your eyes and ears open for more of these videos. But John McNeil, uh, stick around for a minute after we hang up. But right now, I just need to say I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy Friday afternoon to come speak with us at Collapse Chronicles. And more importantly, keep up the good fight. Thank you, Sam. Bye, guys.